a new degree of precision in terms of starting on time. Wait, no, 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 four seconds. Three, two, one. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Matt State. Uh, we're going to dispense with uh, uh, introductions or uh, uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Matt State. I'm the chair of your department. Um, and I'm really delighted to be giving uh, the grand rounds today. Um, I got myself into a little bit of a bind. So um, I, I agreed to do this talk, you know, at the beginning of the year and given the title, et cetera, I sort of forgot that I had done that. And then um, recently, as we've had um, uh, a number of speakers, including distinguished um, speakers over the last several months, um, I've been increasingly concerned about um, the genetics that they've been showing um, and uh, and it's uh, and I wanted to talk about that because um, I was concerned that um, the our, you know as, as psychiatrists it can be tough to sort through that and there's been tremendous progress uh, in the genetics of psychiatric disorders and all common disorders over the last decade and that hasn't been reflected in many of the lectures that you've seen recently so I wanted to talk a little bit about that about basic genetics about how to identify um, uh, genetics that are not systematic and reliable now, so, um, and then that, but then I, um, uh, it was already advertised I was doing the talk on autism and I didn't want to disappoint anyone who's coming for that. So I'm going to try to do two talks <laughs> simultaneously. Um, and uh, so wish me luck. All right, so um, before I start, I want to tell you about my potential conflicts. It's a, a lonely slide. Uh, Blackthorn Therapeutics um, is a company that's trying to develop uh, circuit-based interventions um, uh, for a variety of psychiatric disorders. Autism is not on that list, and nothing that I will talk about today is gonna, um, has any particular relevance for uh, Blackthorn. Um, so the overview, as I said, is that um, it's sort of two talks. It's maybe one and a half talks, and I'm going to uh, do it all in, uh, and leave time for a question. So I'm going to start by um, giving sort of a, a primer on, uh, on genetic variation and, and identifying the relationship between uh, variations in the genetic code and, and psychiatric disorders. Very briefly, again, just trying to highlight some of the critical advances, um, at least to convey some uh, skepticism about what you've been hearing recently um, in some of our um, uh, distinguished visiting lectures. Um, and then I am going to talk about autism particularly around progress uh, in gene discovery um, or risk gene identification, uh, particularly over the last uh, five to ten years. Um, and then what I'd really like to talk about, um, and I feel pretty confident that I'm going to get there, um, is to sort of address the question, what is it good for? If, you know, I'm going to uh, make the case, hopefully convincingly, uh, that uh, we are now able to list uh, genes that carry significant risk for autism that we're uh, confident about that are being uh, reproduced around the world. Um, and the question is, is, is that going to help at all? Is it going to make a difference in the lives of patients? Uh, how do we think about getting from a list of genes to something that, um, that will matter in the clinic? And then I'm hoping, but I put it in parens because I'm not totally confident that I'll get to that last point, which is to talk to you about recent progress that I think uh, is a harbinger of gene uh, um, therapeutics for neurodevelopmental disorders that will be on the horizon within the next say three to five years, and what that means for us thinking about autism and, and um, uh, what you, that we commonly see in the clinics. All right, so wish me luck. Um, before I start, um, particularly because we're going to be racing for time, is I want to make sure that the people who have done heavy lifting on um, most of what you're going to see are recognized here, too, uh, that I hope you know well, um, uh, came with me from Yale, now have started their own laboratories, are doing uh, remarkable work on their own. Uh, you'll see both their individual work, which I'll highlight, and work that they did when they were in the laboratories, both as um, uh, graduate students and postdocs. So that's uh, Stephen Sanders and Jeremy Wilsey, both faculty. Uh, Jeremy's actually uh, in the IND as well as being primary in psychiatry. And then, as always, the folks that are really driving um, the innovation and doing the heavy lifting um, are trainees, and there are a series of postdocs. Uh, um, my, my machine crashed before um, I uh, was able to put Shivash Darbandi's name uh, at the end, and he's uh, a um, co-postdoc um, uh, in uh, my lab and John Rubenstein's lab. So um, here we go. Genetic Variation 101. Um, for those of you who spend a lot of time thinking about this or in the wet lab, uh, you can take about a 
10 minute nap, I'll wake you um, when I'm done. All right, so um, genetic variation. The first thing I want to do is to remind you that the human genome is comprised of three billion bits of information bases. Uh, they're also called the cleotides. There are only four of them. They're abbreviated A, C, G, and T. They're listed here. That is the, what people refer to when they're talking about the genetic code. And every cell in your body that contains a nucleus has the entire three billion bits of the genetic code contained within it. Now, about 1% to 1.5% of that, we're using rough numbers here, um, is the part of the genome that encodes proteins. Uh, and uh, we could spend really the next half hour talking about the definition of a gene, what that means. But just roughly, I'm going to have you hark back to whatever your basic molecular biology was, and we're just going to refer to the coding portion of the genome as that part of the genome that uh, turns DNA into RNA and RNA into proteins. And we know now that there are about 21,000 genes uh, at the turn of the millennium. We were able to sequence the entire genome. There were bets, uh, sort of the mean or the, the most popular guess was about 100,000 genes because mice have about 20,000. And we eked out a win over our rodent um, companions by about 1,000 genes. Interesting question about the tremendous increase in complexity particularly in brain, and how that's mediated by a, a set of genes that are essentially the same size. Now, the most important part of this, in terms of thinking about the rest of my talk, is um, to recognize that if you turn to your left or your right, regardless of who's sitting next to you, you are 985 to 99% identical to that person. I hear some uncomfortable murmuring back there. Um, <laughs> I always say it's why I try to sit next to Eric Kandel whenever he's around. It makes me feel better. Um, but um, uh, so we're, you're, we're 98 to 90, 98 to 99 percent identical, and, and that's important not just for you know that it's science and there are political reasons that we should all remember that now. But um, but from the standpoint of what I want to talk to you about in terms of thinking about the relationship of genes to human disorders, um, what we're concerned with is not the 98 or 99 percent of the genome that's identical between you and your neighbor. It's the one to one and a half percent that varies. Right? So our genetic codes are very similar, but, um, uh, but variation is introduced uh, over the millennia. And, and most of that variation is a consequence of your ancestry. It's demographics. It has nothing to do with illness. But to the extent that we're looking for subsets of people who carry genetic risk, we're looking for where they're different, where that group of individuals is different from other folks. Um, and, and that is why um, my concern is genetic variation. So there are lots of reasons to be interested in the other 98 to 99 percent of the genome, thinking about human evolution, how we are alike or dissimilar from other species, how that has evolved. But the rest of my talk is not is really going to be focused on genetic variation. And when we talk about, when I use a shorthand and say that we're engaged in gene discovery, it's a misnomer. We're not looking for genes that have never been discovered before. We're looking for variations in the genetic code that have an impact on the genome. Could be on genes, maybe not. We're going to talk about that. Um, but it's looking for variation. So really what we're talking about is trying to identify risk variations in the genome and how those are associated with human illness. Now, there are a couple of sort of major dichotomies in thinking about genetic variation I'm going to ask you to remember, and I'll keep coming back to throughout the talk, because they're important for thinking about strategies for gene discovery. And they have different implications for um, that question that I've said that I'm interested in addressing, which is kind of what's a reliable study, what's an appropriate method uh, to be able to identify the connection between genes and, and uh, a condition, and obviously in our case, a neurodevelopmental or psychiatric disorder. So the first is I'm going to um, uh, get a little bit more into this, but just to give you a sense that we that we draw an arbitrary line between variation that is common in the population and variation that's rare in the population. It turns out to have different dynamics. Uh, it is distributed differently in the genome, which I'll talk about in a second. So I want you to remember that when we're talking about variation, if you hear someone talking about variation, it's important for you to register whether or not they're talking about common or rare variation. That 1% line is completely arbitrary. But as a general proposition, we have found as we've sequenced the genome that there are basic differences between things that flourish in a population uh, and those things that are rare in a population. Um, I'm going to come back to that and talk about it in much more detail, particularly because I'm going to tip my hat or tip my hand. <laughs> 
show my hand, tip my hat, show my hand, um, uh, that, uh, that um, the progress in the genetics of autism really has been the, um, almost exclusively up until very, very recently a consequence of looking at rare variation, not common variation. I'll come back to that. Second dichotomy, just to orient you, is between uh, variation that affects kind of what you would consider the structure of a chromosome um, uh, and versus the sequence of the DNA. Um, and that, again, and we, we actually, not everyone agrees where the line is, and I'm going to show you a little diagram in a moment that, that just is useful to get oriented. Exactly where you draw the line doesn't really matter, but by and large, if you just hit one letter in the code, you're talking about a sequence variation. If you hit more than one letter in a code, you're moving into structural variation that has various names. Some people you know, put a, a little bit larger number and say if you have one or two, those are sequence variations, but not hugely important important, but uh, as a general proposition, very small changes in the code are considered sequence changes and larger ones are considered changes in the structure of the DNA. And then the last one that I'm going to spend some time on uh, in terms of a dichotomy, again, quite important for thinking about different methods for identifying a relationship between genetic variation and illness, and particularly important in thinking about progress in autism, is this last dichotomy. Most of what people think about or imagine it in their minds, if they're hearing about a genetic study and don't spend a lot of time doing genetics is transmitted variation. Um, uh, changes in the genetic code that pass from grandmother to mother to daughter, etc. right? So when you're thinking about heritability and you're thinking about genetics, that's the pictures of like, is it something that was in the family tree and has been passed down to increase risk. And, and the, the, in terms of overall numbers, the majority of variation that you see in the genome is transmitted from generation to generation. But in each generation, new variation is introduced into the genome, and that's called de novo variation. If that happens prior or just prior to fertilization um, in sperm or egg, then it'll be in every cell in the offspring and is not present in the parents. It's like a lightning strike uh, to a sperm or an egg, creates a new genetic change. That variation then is present, uh, as I said, in every cell. If it happens after that, it's, a, it's called a somatic mutation, and most cancer uh, is um, when we think about mutations associated with cancer, uh, the vast majority of those, we're talking about somatic mutation, things that are happening after uh, that first cell division, so that means that only a portion of the individual will carry that mutation, right? So a de novo germline mutation uh, is what we call it, happens again in sperm or egg, and then is present in every cell in the offspring um, uh, that has a nucleus and is not present in the parents. So, Common variation versus rare, rare variation, structural versus sequence, and transmitted versus de novo are kind of the, the big categories uh, of variation. So I just want to show you some pictures to help sort of cement that and give you a little bit more detail, again, to give you a sense of scale before I talk about methodology. So sequence variation, as I said, most people will say, well, if it's just a single letter in the genetic code that changes and that's what's supposed to be demonstrated in that box, then that's, um, uh, as I said, a sequence change versus if you have a segment of a chromosome that's lost, deleted, added, duplicated, actually an inversion is for a chromosomal abnormality that's still called a structural variation. And you can have more than um, one copy inserted, as a, so you can have a deletion, you have a duplication, you have an amplification, where a segment of chromosome is repeated multiple times, and that would be considered structural variation. And to take you a little bit deeper into the lingo, really mainly just to help, again, uh, make this less opaque, half of the reason that genetics lectures are impenetrable is because we make up six different synonyms for exactly the same idea and then throw them at you very quickly. And it makes us sound, you know, like we, we're saying a lot. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try to avoid that, but it's going to be tough. So I'm going to reveal uh, some of those um, synonyms right now. So for sequence variation, again, there's the 1% divide. If it's greater than 1%, it's considered common. Um, and we call those... SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So it's at a single nucleotide, and it's considered a polymorphism gives you a sense that it's in the population, has a population frequency, is not a rare or sporadic event. So when you hear someone talk about a SNP study, they are automatically talking to you about common variation in the genome. Okay, There are about 10 million SNPs roughly in the genome. And again, just to give you a sense, when we're measuring SNPs, you need an assay that's going to pick up a lot of things simultaneously. 
Now, if it's less than 1%, and it's rare, we use a bunch of different words, and no one has really agreed on exactly what these definitions are. Um, but we, some people call it a mutation. Some people say, well, it's only a mutation if it's related to disease. But some people just say any change that is at a single base that is rare in the genome, less than 1% is called a mutation. Some people just call it a variant. Some people try to be more specific and sort of match up this, the SNP idea with a single nucleotide variant as opposed to a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, and then often I will refer it, because it's just kind of old nomenclature, as something called a point mutation, meaning that it's at one point in the genome and it's a mutation. All of those are about the same um, uh, and, and don't have any significant differences in terms of what I'm trying to convey by using those terms. On the structural side, copy number polymorphism, again, if you say polymorphism, you're talking about something that's common in the population, and there are some changes in the structure of chromosomes that uh, reach a level of greater than 1% in a general population, and they would be considered CNPs, uh, copy number of polymorphisms. Most structural variation in the genome is rare, and, and here we'll talk about deletions and duplications. Now, if it is too small to be seen by a microscope and there's a change in the structure of the chromosome, the nomenclature we use is a copy number variation. It's not hard and fast. There'll be a handful of things that if you watch carefully, I'll talk about it. You could probably see with a microscope, it takes over a million bits of information to be seen by a light microscope. Um, but as a general proposition, when people are talking about CNVs or copy number variations, they're talking about same things, duplications, deletions, etc., that fall below the resolution of a light microscope. Um, and then very small changes in chromosomal structure are called insertion deletions or indels, and that can just be two, three, four, five bases um, that are uh, inserted or deleted. So that's the nomenclature for that first big dichotomy. Now, I also told you about transmitted versus de novo variation, and, and uh, again, I've already uh, tipped my hand at. <laughs> I, I've already revealed that, that rare variation has turned out to be an important um, uh, area um, or, uh, uh, for uh, investigating the genetics of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, and I'm going to tell you um, and get much more into detail that, in fact, de novo or new variation turns out to be extremely important as well. Um, and so, again, uh, transmitted variation is what you usually think about, I would imagine, if you're thinking about a genetic study, something that, uh, you know, Huntington or uh, sickle cell or things that um, where uh, they're passed from generation to generation. In this case, this diagram is trying to show you that there has been a mutation in sperm or an egg, and in this case, then uh, neither of the parents would have that mutation. Uh, if there were multiple siblings, they wouldn't have the mutation because it's happening just in one sperm or one egg, and then um, uh, you would have someone who would carry the mutation. And we were particularly interested, I'm going to come back to this, that I was talking to you about uh, the genetics, but here what this is showing you is, is a picture of effective status in a pedigree, and the reason I'm showing you this is that if you're looking for de novo mutations, this would be a pattern that would suggest that it, there might be a de novo mutation. It doesn't guarantee that there is, but it essentially looks like this person has been hit by genetic lightning because no one else in the family has, so if, there is, if there's a genetic underpinning to this, it could be de novo, and in fact uh, one of the important advances in the genetics of autism was um, pulling together a large uh, set of, of families that look exactly like this, and that was called the Simon Simplex Collection. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And Simon Simplex was defined by having parents who were unaffected. Uh, there could be only one affected proband, and uh, in about 80% of the families, there was one or more unaffected siblings. And, and that was really to try to enrich for finding these events. So it would sort of be the prima facie suggestion that you might be able to find a de novo mutation in that kind of family. Now, again, these kinds of mutations can either be structural or sequence, and I've told you about that dichotomy for a reason. So the one final point that I want to make before moving on to thinking about how we put this all together and try to figure out how we can associate it with disease is to say that um, the, the scale of these is important to kind of keep in mind uh, as, as we talk about strategies. So I told you that there are about 10 million SNPs 
in the genome. And in fact, most of the assays that we use for SNP studies, um, which we call genome-wide association studies, I'm going to um, get into that in a minute, uh, will assay anywhere between now 500,000 and 5 million spots in the genome that are known, they're transmitted, they're SNPs. Um, and, and that's kind of the scale of an assay for a single individual. Um, and when you're looking for chromosomal abnormalities, including copy number variations, they're a much smaller number. Remember I said almost the vast majority of the variation in the population is carried in common variation. Um, but for any, any um, it takes about 100 individuals to find one or two new copy number variations, particularly those that hit genes. So these are low frequency events in the typical in the typically developing population. And the same is true for point mutations. And here I've shown that in point mutations, they can have different impact on, on uh, the encoded gene if they're in the portion of the genome that, that um, makes genes, uh, we call the coding genome. So a nonsense mutation would be a change that takes you from coding for an amino acid to creating a stop. That can be quite damaging, and we call that either a loss of function or a likely gene disrupting point mutation or single nucleotide variant or whatever. Um, so, um, and similarly, a frame shift uh, would be the insertion or deletion of a small bit of, uh, of a small section of nucleotides that would take one amino acid and move everything over one way or the other. Sometimes this will lead to something that makes sense downstream, but almost always uh, it will um, uh, have an impact and lead to a premature stop codon or, you know, a, a stop signal. Um, and so again, the frame shift mutations, if the, particularly if they're an odd number, so um, remember it's a triplet code, so if you're inserting one or two or deleting one or two um, uh, nucleotides as opposed to multiples of three, then also you will have a likely gene disrupting uh, or loss of function of variation. And here again, we see one germline de novo mutation per coding genome per generation in the typically developing population, right? So we're not looking at 500,000 or 5 million things in an individual, we're looking to see whether we can find one thing, basically, if you're looking for a de novo mutation. And when you sequence the entire genome, right now at the level of current resolution and the part of the genome that is really readable, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 of these across the entire genome, so it's a small number. Okay, so that was a bad sound. Oh, we're going to try that. Okay. So I want to take um, a minute now to talk to you uh, about um, finding the relationship between common variation in the genome and, uh, and a disorder or phenotype, and particularly psychiatric disorder. I'm going to do two slides on this, and then I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about it a tiny bit more, but um, again, for autism, we're mostly interested in rare and de novo mutations. That's where the lion's share of the progress has been. But a lot of what you'll see in the literature uh, for particularly adult onset psychiatric disorders or other complex disorders like hypertension, heart disease, et cetera, will focus on SNP studies and trying to find single nucleotide polymorphisms that are common in the population that are associated with a disease phenotype. And here, um, we had at best a very checkered past up until at a minimum the turn of the millennium. We had not sequenced the genome. We didn't really understand the nature of variation terribly well. And there was between 15 and 20 years a pretty much abject failure in this effort to find a reliable relationship between common variation in the genome and the kinds of, of phenotypes that we see routinely in the emergency room. So bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, et cetera. The way that that was fixed was the following. The first is once we got an idea about actually how much variation there was in the genome and how it was, um, uh, how it was distributed throughout the genome, what we found was that the only way reliably to identify a single SNP in the genome that was associated with disease was to start with a completely unbiased approach, was not to try to guess what SNP might be relevant, but basically to take a look at single nucleotide polymorphisms distributed um, uh, throughout the genome, um, and then to correct for all of those um, observations. And empirically, this ended up um, after several years of trying to figure out do we need to correct for a million, do we need to correct for 
for all 10 million, it turns out that SNPs are not necessarily completely independent if they fall near each other. So you don't have to correct for 10 million, but you do have to correct for a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. And it sounds like it's arbitrary, but in fact it was both at least initially a theoretical threshold, but it, more importantly what it turned out to do was if you did that and then you found a SNP and then you followed that up with an independent replication at p.05, almost everything was replicating. The number of false positives dropped precipitously and suddenly we were in an era of reliable, reproducible gene discovery. Right? So unbiased study, rigorous statistical threshold and internal replication before you report your results. Um, so, um, so again, these were thresholds were developed of necessity to get us out of an era when all we did was fight about whether or not um, the finding was real or not. And, and the candidate gene studies, which were the prior era, that were driven by necessity, we didn't have the ability before the sequencing of the human genome and the development of microarrays to do that kind of study. We couldn't look at all SNPs simultaneously. So we would choose a handful, make them biologically plausible, and ask the question, are these associated with the disease phenotype? And when you do that, um, whether it's based on biological plausibility or playing pin the tail on the genome, it doesn't matter. It doesn't work. And, it, it, and, and the, what I'm going to tell you is that if you do this and say, well, I didn't compare against 500,000 or a million or 10 million, I just asked about three SNPs. So I'm going to take P.05 and divide by three. Or I only looked at one SNP, so I'm going to have a P of 0.5. Even if someone else replicates and publishes that study, it turns out that those studies are empirically not reliable. And when you do study after study, you find that you don't get systematic and reproducible findings. And so what that means is that this is not necessarily wrong, but it is uninterpretable. Because until, and unless and until you do an unbiased genome-wide study that sets a p-value at 5 times 10 to the minus 8 and replicates that, you don't know whether you're right. And in fact, when we found genes using gold standard and gone back to look at what our best guesses were, we, we were terrible. <laughs> terrible. The, out of the first 150 genes that were identified for schizophrenia that had reliable, reproducible um, uh, association using this genome wide approach one, DRD2. It was the only thing that showed up. So one out of 150. We think that there are a thousand genes underlying schizophrenia risk. So randomly, we should have, been, have gotten five right. Just randomly. So that shows you the, the, the inherent flaw of using biological probability or plausibility as a way to move forward in these studies. And this is why candidate gene studies no longer appear in credible genetic studies journals, and they don't appear in science, nature. Unfortunately, they still appear, for reasons that escape me, in uh, the American Journal of Psychiatry and in JAMA and in other psychiatry journals, and that does not do a service to our field. And, and the thing is, again, this has been a, a dramatic change over time. I'm going to spend a, a tiny bit more time on this. Um, but, um, but it's important to know that not only are these not being published, but there has now been an advisory group on genomics to NIMH. There will no longer be any funding for candidates gene studies. You have to do a genome-wide association study in order to demonstrate um, the association of a common SNP with a disease phenotype. And there will be no biological studies that will be funded any longer that are based on old candidate gene studies and, and someone proposing that they're going to try to look and see whether or not the biology makes it more plausible. And the reason is, is that you get into an impossible kind of tautology. If you don't know whether the gene is associated Associated, and it's already clear that biological plausibility doesn't save you, then taking that gene and doing a whole bunch of experiments that shows that it changes synaptic function or that your mouse behaves differently um, does, is, it will never finally address the question about whether or not it's associated reliably with human disease and whether or not it will be reproducible. So again, it doesn't mean that these findings are wrong. We may find that, you know, some of the things that we have held 
beer for a long time are true. So far, it hasn't worked out so well, but we've got a lot of gene discovery left to do. The problem, again, is that it's uninterpretable. And so NIH, NIMH in particular, has a statement. If you go on their webpage and look at genomics, um, it will say that we're no longer funding those grants. And most importantly, it's just that these don't lead to reliable findings, which means that you, if you put a postdoc on a project to follow up on one of these genes, they can spend five years, ten years, trying to get to a place where they find something interesting um, and then it will not, uh, will no longer be a path forward for independent funding. So this is just a picture showing what that methodology is. Case control studies, genome-wide association. You take an array, typically a microarray. It's known spots in the genome. Um, it's between about 500,000 and 5 million. These are incredibly cheap now, 75, 50 to 75 bucks. You take cases, you take controls, you compare them, and you see whether or not there's an excess of particular um, uh, alleles in cases versus controls. And allele is a synonym for a SNP, which I'm sorry I forgot to tell you. Now, now, the, the only final thing that I want you to remember about this, which it, it turns out to be important in kind of the latest wave of studies that are appearing in psychiatric journals, is that the most common reason that people vary far and away is because of their ancestry. It has nothing to do with illness. And so it, you have to be extremely careful that your cases and controls do not have differences in ancestry. And that is not something you can do by asking them about their ancestry or looking at them. There are now genetic tests that can allow you to very precisely identify and correct for any differences in ancestry between cases and controls. Okay? So um, essentially, um, you take cases versus controls, you make sure that the ancestry is not different between the two of them, and then you look and see whether or not there's an overrepresentation or underrepresentation of a SNP. Um, underrepresentation would be, mean that it might be protective. And then these are plotted on something called the Manhattan plot. This is chromosome number. This is p-value. This is from a psychiatric genomics consortium study um, of schizophrenia showing this in, in um, a very prominent finding, but also many any findings. So it's not impossible to find these things. The, the issue is that you need an awful lot of people in these studies in order to find them. And that's because what it's turned out is that for essentially every psychiatric condition, there are no common polymorphisms that carry more than about a 20% increase in risk. Actually, that's almost a ceiling. This one is, the, is kind of the most prominent, largest in schizophrenia, and that has an increased risk of 1.27 for the, the, if you're carrying the, the kind of greatest risk there. So the reason you need large numbers is because the effect sizes are very small and you're sifting through many things simultaneously, et cetera. Now, um, this is going to be my last common variant slide. This is just to say you will see this everywhere, including many of our talks. This is the uh, results from Caspi et al. showing the long and short alleles. This is unreliable data. This would, no one at NIMH will fund any follow-up of short versus long based based on these findings. And so, you know, and, and again, I think the important thing is we have, there are different cultures in different fields. And unfortunately, what's happened in psychiatry is that um, the psychiatry field has been slow um, to keep track of what's been going on in genomics. And it used to be that it was completely acceptable. It was state of the art to do these studies. And it was completely acceptable to argue about why the lab down the street was not getting the same result that you were. That is no longer acceptable. What's acceptable is a well-powered study that accounts for at most a 20% increase in risk, that uses rigorous statistical methods, and that independently replicates repeatedly. And so, um, uh, it, uh, again, it, this is, uh, you know, I, um, on, it's sort of like, uh, in my view, climate science, like saying that there's another side to the argument, I guess, is, is true. You can make an argument that we don't really know. I, I think you can make a plausible argument that we don't know whether or not this is wrong. But I don't think at this point, given the empirical failure to replicate, um, the, the empirical failure to publish um, incredible genetics journals, and the very important empirical failure of NIMH to support these studies, that there's really a lot of question left about whether or not this is a method that anyone should be using in their um, science. And then the last thing that I want to show you is that when you find
find common variation. Most of what we found has been additive, and it leads to a distribution of, um, I'm going to go back for a second, it leads to a distribution of risk in the population. And I've already shown you that any one of those changes in the genome has very, very small impact, right? So if you have one, that biggest allele in schizophrenia, I'm going to come back to this, right? You go and you have no other genetic risk for schizophrenia, um, then you go from having a 1% chance of having schizophrenia to having a 1% chance of schizophrenia. It's actually 1.27, right, if you have the worst genotype. So you're not really moving the needle. If you have a sibling with schizophrenia, you have a tenfold increase in risk in having schizophrenia. So this is a tiny, tiny shift. And one of the things that people have done once they realize when they did these studies that individually these alleles are carrying almost no risk at all, that, that measurable risk, many of them are down to 5% now, and you need 250,000 people in order to find them. They started thinking maybe we can use this usefully by stratifying risk into buckets. And so they've done that. And most studies now will show you something called the polygenic risk score. So they'll just take the distribution of risk across the population. They'll divide it into deciles. And they'll be able to tell you if you have this profile of SNPs, then you're in the highest decile of risk for a given disorder. And if you don't, then you're, you know, then you are wherever you land. Does that make sense? So you can basically make a list of every SNP that you've measured and measure its p-value association from lowest to highest and then just bin people based on what they carry. Now this polygenic risk scores generally include all of the variation in the genome. It doesn't rely solely on those individual SNPs that have been found to be um, significant. So it's a cumulative picture of risk. And the reason that I'm, I'm stressing that is that's pretty cool, right? I mean, if you want to ask something about um, the outcome, say, of an imaging study, then using a polygenic risk score, you could say, well, I'm going to take that group in schizophrenia that's highest polygenic risk score, and I'm going to compare it to the group that's lowest polygenic risk score, and I'm going to learn something about the impact of genetics on imaging or treatment or, right, so theoretically not a bad thing to be able to do. But there are a couple things that I want to sort of highlight about that. The first is you really need to know sort of how much risk that's accounting for. So just because you have high polygenic risk doesn't mean that it's a lot. It just means that it's the tail end of your distribution. And the other really, really important thing, again, that psychiatric journals are doing a terrible job at, is that if, if you do not, the, the only way you can do this is if the polygenic risk score is being applied to the same population from which it was derived. It means nothing in another population except that they're different, have different ancestry. The risk profile, as I told you, most risk in the genome has nothing to do with disease. So if you take a polygenic risk score that was derived in one population and you just take your case control and you say, well, this is, you know, we're going to measure, it is meaningless. And so what you need to do is to make sure that whatever population you're applying it to, you use the same kind of methods to correct for what's called population stratification and make sure for, at a genetic standpoint that you're, that you're looking at something that's very similar. And again, part of the problem with the early kind of run, like everyone has a polygenic risk score in their study now, if you don't see a section that shows that they ruled out differences in ancestry, it's meaningless. Okay. I spent way too much time on that. So, um, but I hope that was useful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's great. All right, so now we're going to move to gene discovery and autism. All right, so I've already uh, actually covered a fair amount that I was going to do in these slides, so I think we're going to be okay. Um, but if not, we'll get as far as we get, and then I'm, I'm you know, I get to come back because I'm the chair. All right, so, um, so the, the, the key shift in gene discovery and autism was the recognition that you needed to look at rare mutations, and particularly that looking at de novo mutations were going to be helpful. And, and I, I, how am I going to explain? Okay, so what, what I want to say is the following. So um, uh, my lab has been focused on rare mutations for a very long time for a reason. And we were focused on rare mutations in autism from the very beginning of my lab, not because I had any confidence that this would um, uh, um, account for the majority of people with autism. In fact, I used to say if I can find one gene associated with autism, even if it's in one in a million people, I, I may be able to use that to understand biology. I'm a big fan of Brown and Gold. 
Goldstein. They, you know, they took a one in a hundred thousand family. They figured out cholesterol biosynthesis, and now we all get to take statins. And it has nothing to do with our genetics. It's because they understood the biology, and that was kind of the model in the lab. Now, so that model would presuppose that the most important thing is not to look for stuff that's going to explain a lot of population risk, but to look for variations that carry a lot of biological weight that really move the needle. And so, as I as I said, there's a rare and common variation. And one of the things that I didn't talk about a lot is that as a general proposition, we had an idea early on that if something was common in the population, it was unlikely that that would have large effects. And the reason is that natural selection works. So if you have a large effect for a bad neurodevelopmental disorder, one that leads to lower IQ and lower social functioning, that almost undoubtedly will lead to a reduction in what we call classic reproductive fitness. And, and if there's even a slight decrease in the rate at which um, uh, individuals who carry those mutations and have those phenotypes reproduce, it very quickly will reduce the frequency of that mutation in the population because natural selection really does work at a population level. There have been tons of studies to show that. And so at the start, even though we hadn't been successful in gene discovery, we just figured if we were going to pick between looking for rare and looking for common, and what we wanted to find was something with big effects, we were going to look for rare. Okay, so that's why we started with rare. De novo actually was um, was chosen for two reasons. So. The first is that theoretically, um, when you think about it, the kind of mutation where there would be the least amount of time for natural selection to act would be a de novo mutation, right? Because it happens just prior to fertilization. And so if, if a fetus comes to term, it can have a terrible neurodevelopmental problems. If it comes to term and you're able to do genetics, you can find that de novo variation. And there's been no time for natural selection to to impact that mutation, the effect size of that mutation. So within rare variation, you would expect that de novo variation had the potential to have the very largest effects in the population. The second reason is that another lab beat us to it and showed <laughs> that de novo mutation was overrepresented in kids with autism. So Mike Wiggler and Jonathan Sabot in about 2006 showed just empirically you took 200 families with autism, 200 families without, and you look for the kinds of families that I showed you where there was only one affected in individual, and if you just counted up the number of de novo mutations, um, there was an increased rate in folks with autism versus those without. Those initial studies were done looking at copy number variation, and the reason for that is because we couldn't look at single base resolution yet. There weren't the tools available, so we had to look at chunks of DNA, and we could get down to about 10,000 base pairs of DNA. We could go below the resolution of light microscope, so we did, they did, this copy number variation study, actually there were several labs. Um, uh, um, uh, at the same time, the one that was most focused on autism and de novo mutation in 2006 um, was, uh, I think it was published in 2007, was the Sabat and Wiggler paper, which is why <coughs> we noted. it. But, um, uh, but what we were able to do then is that the Simons Foundation got very interested in that finding, and they created a cohort of patients that ultimately reached about 3,000 families that had this pattern for the reasons that I described. If it looks like it's hit by lightning, it might have been hit by lightning. And then I led a large um, actually, it wasn't that large. Twelve site consortium for the Simons Foundation from the origin of this sample um, called the Simons Simplex Genetics Consortium. So um, uh, we led one group, and then Mike Wiggler, who made that initial finding, led, did basically his own thing with the same sample. And we ended up coming up with the same answer. And the answer was that we could replicate the finding that Wiggler and Sabat have, where there's an overrepresentation. This is the affected sibling, oh, sorry, the affected proband versus the sibling. So this is a beautiful comparison. You're looking within families. 80% um, of the families had an unaffected sibling and an affected sibling, and we just counted. Do they have a, a de novo copy number variation or not? And what we found was that um, regardless of how we count, initially, and the original cohort in 2011, you'll see Stefan Sanders was first author on this from my lab at the time, now independent, as I said. Um, then, so there was a, a, an initial study at Sanders in 2011 showed this, and then the um, a new sample showed this, and the combined sample showed this. It doesn't matter how you count. There's an increased rate of de novo copy number variations in cases versus controls. And um, if uh, you look at regions of the genome that uh, correspond to coding, the, the, the excess 
rate goes way up, suggesting that genes are important, okay? W once we did copy number variations, it didn't take long. We were working hard on developing tools to be able to sequence the entire coding portion of the genome simultaneously, called whole exome sequencing, and we repeated exactly the same experiment, looking at the proband versus the sibling, um, first in about 200 families, and we're surprised that even at 200 families, we were able to find the same thing, an increased rate of de novo point mutations in cases versus controls. Not any point mutation, the kinds that I pointed to you, uh, pointed out to you, were likely to damage the gene. Okay, so if you had a mutation that was silent that wasn't going to damage the gene, there's no increased rate in cases versus controls. But if you look at ones that change the code of the protein, and particularly those that are nonsense mutations, um, meaning the stop codon or frame shift that, that leads to a stop codon, then you get this increased rate. And here you're looking at this, you're thinking, he told me 5 times 10 to the minus 8, and there's only p-value 0.05 here. We are not identifying specific genes here, not attempting to do that. We really are asking a single question, is there an over-representation, and can we replicate the prior finding of just globally an increased rate of these mutations in cases versus controls, and even with that, we used it two-tailed just to make sure that we were not um, uh, um, whistling. Dis Dixie, is that still a saying? Uh, anyway, um, and, then, and then most importantly, uh, the sample grew, and I'm going to show you a, a series of about 15 papers that all found exactly the same thing simultaneously, which is the most important confirmation of a method. Like, I can try to convince you of the statistics, and if, you know, my competitor, Evan Eichler, or uh, uh, Mark Daly, if they're getting different answers, uh, it doesn't matter if I spend time trying to convince you. So this is the initial sample of about 200. This is the sample of about 2,500. Again, uh, Stefan, and here we were collaborating with some of our competitors, including Evan Eichler and Mike Wiggler. Uh, we put the whole thing together and got the same finding. The one last thing that I want to show you, whoops, is that, um, yeah. Uh, I think it's probably worth it. Um, is this. So we also asked the question, if you look at de novo mutation, is it, is it just that the genome is hypermutable, right? Is it that you're just getting mutations everywhere in kids with autism and you're not getting that in kids without? That would show an increased rate of de novo loss of function mutations, but it would also show you um, that you would be more likely to have multiple mutations in kids with autism, and it would also show you that all classes of mutation would likely be increased. Right? If you were randomly having hypermutability, then silent mutations would be increased and loss of function mutations would be increased. And we don't see either of those things. This is the distribution of multiple hits, if you will, multiple de novo mutations in cases versus controls. And you can just eyeball this and see that it's the same distribution. Right? So it's not like kids with autism have two, three, four de novo loss of function mutations. They got essentially one is what's making the difference. And that's, and that's reinforced by this, what I showed you previously. Silent mutations don't change. And it turns out when you look at copy number variations, if you really go to regions of the genome where there are no genes, those are very close in cases versus controls. And all of that suggests it has nothing to do with hypermutability. What you're looking at is the increased risk that's associated with these kinds of events, right? Because the reason that they're getting put in the affected pile is because that mutation is causal, or at least highly contributory to the phenotype. And that's going to increase the rate of specific types of events, not the overall mutation rate. Every study subsequently has shown that the mutation rates in autism are no different than the mutation rates not in autism. It's the kind of mutation. And, and there are two really cool things about de novo mutation um, that um, assist in getting to, from this kind of global observation, that there's an increased rate of de novo mutation cases versus controls down to the specific gene. So there are two things. One is signal to noise. Remember I told you, in the entire coding genome, there is one one sequence change in a typically developing individual. If you look for a loss of function, a likely gene disrupting mutation, you have to do, look at 10 typically developing individuals about that to find one loss of function mutation. And that means that your signal to noise is excellent. It also means that you don't need advanced math skills. So what you do is you look at cases and you look at controls and essentially all you're doing in each case is counting to one. And then, and then looking at that, you know, at the two 
groups, okay? But the second thing is really important, which is we knew that we needed to come up with a rigorous statistical framework in order to identify specific genes because of the experience with common variation. Just because if we saw, like if you look through the genome, there are some people who are walking around who have a de novo loss of function mutation and are perfectly fine. And while there's an increased rate in cases versus controls, just seeing that does not confirm that you're looking at something that's relevant. And we knew that genetics is tough, and there was 20 years of us getting it wrong. So we needed to come up with a rigorous statistical framework, and we couldn't just say use, you know, 5 times 10 to the minus 8 because it's a kind of a different problem. There's a different amount of mutation in the genome, and we're asking a slightly different question. One of the great things is that question can be asked in the following way. So, the genome is a big place. We know that in a typically developing individual, you don't even get one shot per generation for a loss of function mutation. You've got to go 10 often, 5 to 10, before you get a shot, okay? So in that situation, you can ask the question, how likely is it that you, that lightning strike will hit the same spot in the genome twice, right? So. Does that make sense? So big target, very few shots at the genome. It gives you tremendous statistical power. So instead of just counting, we have X in cases versus X in controls, we use a, a very reliable, very classic approach to statistics that uh, kind of previously had been used in something to figure out something called the birthday problem, which is if you have five people in a room, how likely is it that you will both, that someone will have the same birthday? Okay? So we can say there are 20,000 genes, and I use the dice here because what we're asking is we know how common variation is, we know how many genes there are, we know how many mutations there are per generation. I can tell you what the chances are that you're going to roll two 20,000s, right, or two sevens. It's very low at a base rate. And so what that means is very quickly, if you start seeing de novo loss of function mutations in a single gene, you're looking at something that is stretching the bounds of plausibility under the null hypothesis. and, and you can really reliably then begin to identify um, uh, specific genes. Now again, we came up with a statistical approach first to CMVs, then we applied it to point mutations. Three other groups were working simultaneously. A whole bunch of papers came out simultaneously, all using varying ways of thinking about the problem with the same underlying idea. These are rare, low frequency, high signal to noise events that have, you know, that are spontaneous and so you can use recurrence of de novo mutation as a way to identify specific genes. And this is a paper, again, Stefan um, has made remarkable contributions, honestly, to the field along with, you know, a, a whole bunch of other folks in the lab. Um, but, um, and what this is, is by 2015, basically everyone had gotten together. Uh, we put all of our data together from all the competitive groups. We all essentially independently gotten the same answers. Um, and we came up with, at the time, and now actually even, there, there's a new paper out that is going to update this to 103 genes, but this shows the genes that now have been identified using recurrence, they are highly reproducible and replicable, and we can tell you with, with a lot of precision what the statistics are. And here we've used a loose threshold of 0.1 as an FDR, um, uh, and, and when we talk about this, basically we say if you're going to make a mouse or a non-human primate, you, you probably want to be in this bucket where there's an FDR of less than 0.01, which is essentially equivalent to genome-wide correction like the 5 times 10 to the minus 8, but if you're doing a study, you know, say an informatics study, these genes are almost undoubtedly going to move over into what we consider our highest confidence autism group. And this is now showing for, for CNVs and for uh, point mutations. Very recently, um, this has now been um, uh, uh, copy, uh, sorry, uh, common variation finally in autism. There's 30,000 people in the study, and they've been able to identify five loci that are um, uh, uh, significantly associated, and the effect sizes are very small. And just to drive that home, this again is schizophrenia. This has um, got a much stronger signal than, than what we've seen so far in autism. It's a gene called C4, and just to remind you that while that's a p-value, this is the effect size. And if you look at the distribution 
combination of risk and a polygenic risk score, um, you have to get, in schizophrenia anyway, to the top decile of risk to equal the impact of a single loss of function mutation in autism, right? So it would take you literally hundreds of risk variants for schizophrenia that are transmitted in the population to have the same biological effect of a single mutation in high confidence gene. And for autism, the story is even worse. Right now, the highest decile polygenic risk will give you an odds ratio of about three. So the cumulative, the cumulative amount of risk that we can explain in common variants uh, with autism still is quite low. And, and I think I'm going to have to um, just finish with explaining this part of the slide, and we're going to have to do, I, I think I only got to genes. We'll have to do genes to biology at some other point in time, because I have very interesting things to say about that. Um, but I'll finish off here with just explaining sort of the last bit about this gene discovery part and how we now understand at least the genomic architecture of autism. And that's the following. So the people who spent a lot of time collecting 30,000 samples for autism and doing genome-wide association studies will knock what we're doing and say, you account for 3% rare de novo mutations account for 3% of the population risk for autism. So we account for the vast majority, and so one, you, yours may not generalize, and 3% is a really small number. Okay, so, and, and I'm going to say, well, first of all, biology is biology, and I'd much rather have, and, it's, and the rest of the talk was going to point out why. For any neurobiologist in the room, I won't need to explain why it's a whole lot better for me to tell my neurobiology colleagues that I've got a single gene with a 50-fold increase in risk that corresponds to the coding portion of the genome that they cannot out in a zebrafish or uh, frog or mouse or non-human primate as compared to saying, well, you're going to have to model 500 simultaneous variants in order to get the same amount of risk. So, um, but but I, beyond that, um, I, I'm going to explain to you why I can also make the statement that while it only accounts for 3% of population risk, it actually accounts for a significant minority of the clinical population that we'll see, and in some cases, more than a minority, and this is why. Okay, so I want you to think about two distributions. One is the population risk, and I showed you for common variation, this is pretty much how the curves come out, um, that there's a, it's pretty much additive, and there are individually small effects, and they generally distribute normally, and that's population risk. And, and you can imagine, and we think that symptoms pretty much more or less also distribute like that. People, there are some people with, you know, tremendous social competence, and then there are some people with severe social impairment, and most people will be in the middle. And you can kind of superimpose these two curves because you can say, well, people who have very high genetic risk, particularly for autism, where there's overall a very high genetic load, are going to fall in the affected range. And so what that shows you is that while the population risk is explained by the curve, most most of the people with population risk don't show up in your clinic. So saying that the affected individuals account for 3% of overall population risk to a clinician is kind of meaningless because this is the population that we're concerned about. And when you take a look at what happens with these large effect de novo mutations, even though they account for 3% of population risk, they account for a much larger proportion of the kids that we will see and adults that we'll see in clinic. So probably now about 20% percent, but it depends on how you ascertain the clinical sample. If you have a clinical sample that has an enriched number of girls who, and there's epilepsy and there's some intellectual disability, now for most medical geneticists, they're finding a known genetic cause in more than half of the sample that are coming into their office. So that's why when people say it's only 3% of population risk, it, that may not be the, the kind of knock that they mean it to be. It also means, though, and I'll come back to it if we talk about biology to genes to biology at some point, is that even though these have a large effect, you will find people who have these mutations who are not going to cross that threshold and end up, um, uh, so it's not Mendelian in the sense of either you got it or you don't, it's, it's more complicated than that. So um, I, unfortunately, um, I, I hope that this was useful, I spent more time on kind of basic genetics than I thought. Um, I, I, this now, I've sort of set up, I think, what is really the challenge today now, which is now that we have a gene list, what is it good for? How do we think about using that? How do we leverage the knowledge that these cause a problem in humans and think about how you apply that to non-human species? It's quite, it's much more complicated than we anticipated initially, but I think does set an important path forward, both to elaborate biology and ultimately to begin to think about whether, in some cases, manipulation of those genes where we found very high risk might ultimately be a therapeutic. And I'm going to have to leave that as a teaser for a few
future lecture. So thanks for your attention. And we have a So you should do as I say and not as I do. When you give talks, you should leave more than two or three minutes for uh, answers at the end, and you should really try to time your talk so that you're not doing what I'm doing right now um, because it's frustrating to see all these slides and go, ee, ee, ee. but I, the reason I'm doing this uh, is to get to here because it's very important. Again, w we would have nothing without the people who are both contributing to the lab, funding the research, and the patients, particularly the Simon Simplex Collection, who donated their time and effort. Yes. So is any mother or father at equal risk for generating a new you know, mutation? Do they have age is associated with a parent with risk for autism? Yes. Okay, so the question is, is everyone equally vulnerable to de novo mutation? The short answer is no. What we do know about the dynamics of de novo mutation is that um, the, the largest driver, apart from the actual sequence of the DNA, is the age of the father. Most of these mutations that I'm showing you, point mutations, not CMVs, but point mutations, are, are in sperm, not an egg, because of the multiple replications of sperm cells. Um, so there is an increased rate um, that is pretty linear across age, so, um, the, the only, so it, it does begin to give you an idea about how you might explain this increased rate of autism in, a, in kind of a secular time frame because older marriages would lead to increased rates of de novo mutation and everyone and since de novo mutation can increase the risk for autism, increase rates of autism. Unfortunately, it accounts for about 0.05% of what we think is the incre overall increased risk based on epidemiology um, and so uh, it, it's, this is not a, a significant explanation for that. That and also kind of puts that risk in context. Yes? Uh, I wonder if you can speak to the possible role of candidate genes in fine type localization. Uh, once you narrow the region of interest down to five or six genes, but in that case, there may be some role for understanding the physiology and how the physiology of the given gene matches up with the disorder in, in prioritizing. Okay. The genes in that region. Yeah. So when you're talking about a region, there would be two ways of thinking about that. One would be um, that. Uh, um, in a, in a common variant study, um, and another would be if you found a CMV that had multiple genes in it and then wanted to know whether or not maybe one of those genes looked like the gene that was responsible. In neither case do candidate gene approaches work. Empirically, they fail. And, and so when people have fine math, for instance, I mean, this, a lot of this hasn't been done um, yet, but the problem is is that 80% um, of genes are expressed in brain, and there are so many plausible stories about biology and still so little known about pathways that the likelihood that you will know enough about a series of genes to be able to rely on biological plausibility even out of five genes turns out not to be a great way to do it. So the only way to do it is brute force at this point. At some point in other fields, as biology gets much deeper than the possibility of knowing that you've got a binding partner of another risk gene, etc., and you really know the biology, we're not there yet for any of our disorders. In fact, so the best advice that I ever got was from Chris Walsh about how to look in one of these candidate regions, which was to list the genes from most plausible to least plausible and then turn it over and go for the least plausible gene first. And honestly, when you look at fine mapping, it, some of that is ascertainment bias because, you know, it's the surprising thing that gets into science. But there, we really don't know enough. With CNVs, the problem is it, for most copy number variations, if it's multigenic, right now we don't have a lot of, we don't know how to differentiate between CNVs where it's multi or oligogenic and they're multiple versus those where there's a single gene. And so right now the way that that's being resolved is simply by doing exactly the same kind of statistical tests that you do genome-wide and you just pound at it until you find the gene. It'll change, but it's so far we haven't found a reliable way to get down to candidate genes for any sort of fine mapping yet. Of, uh, um, and, and I think that's a general consensus of people who spend their time doing um, human genetics as opposed to doing psychiatric genetics. Yes. That in uh, neurodegenerative disorders, um, earlier onset yes. symptoms seem to be a stronger predictor of a, of a rare gene with a big effect. Yes. You don't have that same sort of flexible range of yes. autism, but it's the age of onset 
It's a great question, and when we first started trying to look for rare mutations, we didn't yet sort of focus in totally on de novo, and so we were looking at some families and thinking, because we're also doing Tourette um, syndrome as well as autism, we thought maybe, so autism, the problem is, is that for most kids, onset is within the first six months of life, even if diagnosis isn't until 18 months or two years, you start to see pretty reliable differences in the trajectory of social behavior earlier than that. So early onset is a hard, almost impossible possible thing to parse for a genetic study. We found with Tourette, um, and in autism, ultimately, when we're able to look at severity, the severity of social disability doesn't help much. Intellectual disability and motor function, uh, so the more evidence there is of global neurodevelopmental dysfunction, the more likely you are to find a de novo mutation contributing. Um, but it hasn't, it wasn't a reliable way, and we, we definitely tried. And it didn't help with Tourette either. You know, we found some kids that had onset at age four in a family, and it just, and, and my guess is that, you know, these genes are acting very early. They're having pleiotropic effects overall on neurodevelopment. And so parsing the moment when we see symptoms is not a great indicator of underlying pathophysiology, which also, you know, for the majority of neurodegenerative processes actually turns out to be the case as well. By the time you see symptoms, you know, you, you, you may have had pathology for 10 to 20 years. Or you likely did, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, please go if you, yeah. Commercial pharmacogenetics or yes. tests. Yes. Uh, that the um, SNPs or genes for the panic metabolic yes. function are fairly well established. Correct. That the genes for relationships of drug with psychiatric disorder are based mainly on, I think, on candidate gene Correct. findings and are inherently, Useless. by your logic, unreliable. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm, really, I'm not trying to make fun. I mean, again, the reality is the reason I'm making a strong statement about it, and I really do want to reflect the fact that this is a strong consensus. I mean, you know, you can't get to geneticists, particularly working in different fields. If there's really a debate, someone is going to take the opposite side, right? We And I was part of the genomics group that advised the NIMH about candidate gene studies, and there was literally unanimity about making the cutoff. And there were questions about, you know, what is the right cutoff for rare variants versus common. But, but candidate genes have been so unreliable. And so the problem is, you're right, the question was about pharmacogenetic studies. For hepatic metabolism, there's a clear relationship between hepatic metabolism and the metabolism of drugs that we use, and that can be a useful clinical tool. How useful um, can vary, but but it is um, that is an exception to the rule of people using a targeted approach to be able to understand something about what we do in the clinic. But as uh, Craig has pointed out, all of those studies that purport to show a type of depression, a glutamatergic type of depression versus or whatever else, or measure the serotonin long and short allele, that those studies have not replicated. And unfortunately, so far, pharmacogenetic studies have not yet reached the point where they're well powered. The only ones that have been done in a gold standard way have not had sufficient power yet to identify relationships. As far as I know, there may, I, I've heard rumor that there's something coming out in depression because now they have 250,000 people where there may be um, more reliable um, findings. But right now, those tests are... are useless. And, and you know, I go to these things and they have genes that we discovered in my lab, like on it for subtypes of autism, like, it's terrible. I mean, there, there's just no, it makes no sense at all. So I, I think that's important and I try to go to as many meetings as possible and let people know that there's not a strong science, there's no scientific basis for the vast majority of those tests, yeah. Uh, thank you, very enlightening and helpful talk. I actually had a patient, just to bring it to clinical practice, had a patient who was referred to me kind of a questionable diagnosis and we ended up um, thinking maybe OCD, maybe autism traits, but ended up I referred him to the genetics clinic because I thought there was enough here that had me concerned. Came back with a shank 2 deletion. And, and so I'm like, oh, okay. Um, there was a little bit of a then what, and of course the, the next step in terms of the research I'm very intrigued by. Uh, how would you approach, like, how, how do we take this information into the current public practice, at least in terms of conversations with the families about the implications of a genetic science? Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's a great question. And, and um, uh, and so the, the first thing is is that um, as a general proposition, there is, n there is no clinical value to what I've just shown you apart from uh, uh, distinct from the family simply wanting to know whether or not they can identify um, the mutation. 
there's no immediate, uh, let me change that a little bit. So there's, there's nothing about this that's going to direct treatment or tell you about natural history. And in fact, there's so much overlap, which is where I was going to start to go in terms of the complexity of understanding this, is that while these genes code for autism, they also code for a range of other neurodevelopmental disorders. So even if you found shank, it's not going to help you even with the differential diagnosis between OCD and autism because it could be a risk for either gene. And they're so broad. We have genes, that single gene that in some kids is showing up as ADHD and others schizophrenia and others autism. So it's not diagnostic uh, and it's not going to tell you about natural history or treatment. What it will do is some families really want to know and, and it takes them from being in this kind of haze of we have no idea what's happening here at least to being able to say that there's something that we can identify and I can show you data that begins to point out from a biological standpoint we can say more than the gene. We can start to say when in development for some genes we can even start to say where in the brain for some genes that the risk appears to be consolidating. So there is information that's just not clinically relevant. However, my experience clinically is that a lot of families really value that, not only just because it's hard to have something really bad happening and have the doctor say, I have literally no idea why this is going on. And then the second thing is, is that now increasingly there are groups of, of families that have come together around specific mutations which are going to empower the next generation of research. So like Steph and Sanders is moving forward with the first gene we discovered in the lab, thinking about gene discovery, I mean about gene therapy for these mutations, and there's a family group of SCN2A mutation carriers, there are there hundreds in the United States that are not only talking with each other about the symptoms and natural history, but also signing up for research, contributing to research, etc. So that's really right now where the concrete value is in the clinic. Yes? Thank you. But what were you going to say, really? <laughs> uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about the fact that some of the immune system genes pop up in the U.S. studies and the Taliban variation. What do you think is the new thing that you can do to actually account for the emergence in the rare variants? Okay. So great question. What about the immune genes that are popping up in GWAS? Um, and, and the answer is there are immune genes that are popping up in GWAS for schizophrenia um, that, that uh, look to be profoundly important. We don't really at this point understand. So, you know, that the, the uh, Freedom Tower of schizophrenia findings is actually a gene in the complement cascades, the C4 allele. We don't really understand, even if you see, and this is part of the challenge of going from genes to biology, is the way that we think about and annotate genes is almost entirely an incomplete data set. So we may identify something as an immune gene, but Carla Schatz may show us three months from now that it's actually incredibly important for early synaptic development. And, you know, it's what uh, Beth Stevens and, and others, you know, that they, they found genes for schizophrenia that um, are quote-unquote immune genes but are intimately involved with synaptic remodeling early in development. But I can't tell you, I mean, she makes a great story, but she really doesn't know whether it's that or or a more classical immune response uh, that, that may be relevant. And as Chris Bartley uh, showed us in his talk, the idea that there may be a direct connection between immune function or dysfunction and symptoms, not, you know, not mediated through like early synaptic development, or maybe it is, both all of those things I think are still really on the table. There is no signal for immunity in the autism genetic findings so far. None. So people say, you know, people are really interested in this because it was a science study where they took a mouse and they messed around with IL-17, I think, and then and then the mouse behaved badly. And, and no, seriously, and they said, well, it looks like autism. And so, the, you know, and so the idea that, that interleukins are involved in brain development, you know, uh, sure, great. But, but so far in humans, which is really key and why I'm so focused on the genetics, out of the 105 genes so far for autism, they parse into synaptic genes and chromatin modification gene expression. By and large, there are a couple stragglers. There is no enrichment for uh, immune function in, in autism. So I think it's an incredibly important area of study, and, and we got a long way to go. There could well be. I mean, we see clinically that there's an overrepresentation in samples in autism for things like asthma um, and, uh, and uh, other um, atopic disease. So so the notion that there's some link that we don't understand I think is tremendously important. Right now the genetics has not taken us there. Thank you. I'm sorry I kept you so long afterwards.